I don't know if you've ever gotten an extravagant gift, but when it pulled up in her driveway, I imagine that she had to have been pretty shocked that this is what she was getting for Christmas. It was a Mercedes Maybach GLS 600S. I didn't know what that was, but apparently it's an SUV that costs $200,000. But that's not it. In fact, she didn't get just one of these spectacular SUVs. She got five of them for Christmas this year. A million dollars worth of metal and tires was given to Kim Kardashian by her husband, Kanye West, this Christmas. And, and she returned in kind, and, and the gifts that she lavished on him had to do with some famous artist, I guess, and a and million dollars worth of artwork she gave to Kanye West. But here's the thing. They, they did this at their $40 million uh, mansion down in Southern California. But you see, Kanye West has been living off in his mansion in, I, I believe it's Montana or Wyoming or something like that. And she's been living down in Southern California. They're on the brink of a divorce and, and this is how they celebrate. And these are the gifts that they give to each other. And you have to wonder if maybe the gift that would really matter to them is time together to actually, truly love each other. We've been talking about the first angel's message, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. Turn there with me in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 6. We've spent a few weeks looking at this, actually a little over a couple months looking at it. Verse 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. It's gospel, which is good news, not good advice. All right, you're on it today. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Do you know the Bible says that God is the giver of every good gift. I want you to imagine another gift that took place when, when someone suddenly opened their eyes and they looked around and, and there right in front of them was the most beautiful being that they had ever, that, that you could possibly conceive of. And as they, they sat up and they looked around, they saw a beautiful planet that, that God said was very good. You see, God is an incredible artist. And in Genesis chapter 1, it reveals that as he creates, he does it in a very systematic and beautiful way. Genesis 1, he first says, on the first day, God said, let there be light. And there was light. The second day, he made the separation between the waters below and the waters above. And then the, the third day, what did he create the third day? He, he made the separation between the, the water and the dry land. And God does it in such a beautiful way that, that then the fourth day, what he's doing is he's, he's filling those spaces. There's this systematic, artistic, beautiful way that God creates this planet. And, and on the, the, the fourth day, he's filling the, the space of light with sun, moon, and stars. And on the fifth day, what did he create the fifth day? We have the, the waters below, and we have the sky above. And so he creates the birds and the fish. And the sixth day, he gets what is created to, to dwell on the land is the mammals. And, and here you, you see the systematic parallel a creation that's taking place. And all of it is building up to something. And, and pick up the story in Genesis chapter 1. When, when God creates and Adam is formed out of the dust, God speaks to him in, in verse uh, 28. Then God blessed them, that's Adam and Eve, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields to you, to you it shall be for food. So this is a gift, this entire planet, it is very good, and it's for you. I have given it to you as a space for you to live 
and, and to, to develop relationships. I, I've, I've created you, Adam and Eve, to have relationships and you to have a family and to, to rule over this earth, to subdue it, to take care of it. And I imagine that the Adam and Eve's response in that moment might have been, okay, so when do we get started? Let's go, let's get this done. But what does God do? God created this beautiful planet. And I imagine as they look around and maybe they see a giant redwood over there. And, and Adam, Adam can't say, okay, God, I helped you figure out how to formulate those pine needles. And, and that's, we worked on that together. You can't look over at that elephant and say, God, I, I helped you design that, the trunk of that elephant. But every aspect of all of creation was given as a gift, full and free to Adam and Eve. And they had no part in it. They didn't know how it came into existence, except for that God said, here's what I have done. And then, verse, chapter 2 and verse 1 says, Then the heavens of the earth and all the hosts of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he, had re he rested from all the work which God had created and made. So God creates in six days, and the culmination of that, there's a chiastic structure in Genesis chapter 1. As you see, day 1 is parallel to day 4, and day 3 is parallel to day 5, and day uh, four, day 2 is parallel to day 5, sorry, and day 3 is parallel to day 6. It's all leading somewhere. It's leading to day 7. The completion, the culmination of all of creation is God says, I created you. Now let's spend some time together. This is a day that I, I made for us to be together. And the gift of gifts that God could give was to be with us. He created you and I for fellowship, for relationship, for us to be together with God and with each other. If only Kanye and Kim could realize that far more important than the material around them is that relationship of love that God has designed for us to enjoy. Revelation chapter 14, when it says, God, we worship God who made the heavens, the earth, this, and the, the fountains, is, is a direct allusion, a direct quote to the fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20. This is one of the clearest references in all of uh, Revelation to the Old Testament, one of the clearest quotations in all of, of, of Revelation. So go with me to Exodus chapter 20, where we pick up the Ten Commandments. And as we go there, we, we see that it's a, it's a crucial thing that, that is being brought out here in Revelation chapter 14, because all of Revelation chapter 13 is about the Antichrist and how Satan has co-opted religion throughout history in order to misrepresent the character of God. And, and the, the language that's used is, well, first of all, the, the, the sea beast causes people to worship God the dragon. What's the first commandment say? You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, the first thing that the Antichrist does is he teaches people to worship, but to worship the wrong thing, a false understanding of who God is. What's the second commandment? That's right. Good job, Gunner. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. What happens with the land beast? He causes an image to the sea beast to be made and has everybody come to worship this image. What's the third commandment, Gunner? Exactly. Good job. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the, the sea beast in Revelation chapter 13 is said to blaspheme the name of God. It's blaspheming the character. It's misrepresenting the character of God. So systematically in Revelation chapter 13, you're having worship talked about and a false worship system that is systematically breaking the commandments of God. And then you come to Revelation chapter 14, and there's a direct allusion to the fourth commandment, which is this. Revelation chapter, or Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, 
nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Here you have slaves that have been brought out of slavery, that all they've known is they had to make bricks day in and day out. That's what they were identified as, is, is just the, uh, the backs that could build the Egyptian empire. And God says, here's how it works. Take a day off. You don't have to be defined by what you do. Because you are human beings, not... Were any of you here last week? Human doings. You are human beings. You are loved by the God of the universe. And you are defined by what He has done and how He feels about you, not by what you can accomplish in your life. And it's incredible because when Moses repeats the law in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy comes and it's, it's the second reading of the law. And this comes after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And you think about all the mistakes that they made. I mean, first of all, you have the golden calf right there at Mount Sinai. And then you have time and time again where they're complaining and a, a plague will break out and where they're, they're doubting God, they're not trusting God. They didn't go into the promised land because of their doubting. And all of these different things happen. They have made failure after failure after failure. And so when, when Moses repeats the law to them, he has to help them understand what this Sabbath is really all about. Because he, he changes one part under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of the Ten Commandments. The only other time the Ten Commandments are listed is in Deuteronomy chapter 5. If you go there with me. Deuteronomy chapter 5. The commandments all... Nine of them, besides the Sabbath commandment, are exactly the same. But when you get to the Sabbath commandment, something is different. Because rather than saying, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, verse 15 says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This is, this is my gift to you as a, a remembrance, a memorial of the fact that I saved you. I brought you out of bondage. I brought you out of slavery. And because of that, I want for you to take this day for building relationship with me. It's a really incredibly beautiful thing that the creator of the universe, who's created absolutely everything, Adam and Eve step into this beautiful gift of a planet, then says, hey, here's some time. And then he repeats that by saying, hey, not only did I create you, but I'm the one who saves you. And it's fascinating that as you look through the Bible, how God saves is by the same power that he uses to create. The God who can, it's called ex nihilo, call things out of nothing into existence. Who can say, let there be light, let there be plants. Who can speak and it happens, it exists. That same God in your life, in your experience, is the one who saves. The same power of the word transforms. Last week, we looked at how 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5 says that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. He's rewritten our history, and you are accepted in the beloved. You are his beloved child with whom he is well pleased. And that's not based on what you can accomplish. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter uh, four, the chapter before, this is a beautiful reference to creation, Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. And you'll find again and again that the, the creation language is used to describe how salvation happens. While you're headed to Second Corinthians, think of the story of David. When David had that atrocious uh, sin of, of stealing Bathsheba from Uriah, having Uriah murdered he's committing adultery when he's convicted of that I, Psalm 51 this beautiful prayer of repentance the, the climax of it is verses 10 to 12 where he says create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit in within, within me restore unto me the joy of your salvation 
just use that creative power. The word there is bara in the Hebrew. It's only used for God's creative power. Create in my heart a different reality from what is there right now. I need salvation, and I can't accomplish it. Only you can. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 says it this way. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Just think of the description in Genesis chapter 1. When, when the, the earth is described, it said that it was formless and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep. It, it, it's a picture of chaos. It's a picture of, of nothingness. It's a picture of emptiness. It's a, it's a picture of, of space that needs to be filled. And when you look at the world today, the unrest, and maybe when, when you look at your own heart, when I look at my own heart, I recognize that there is darkness. There is a confusion. There's chaos. Look at what it says. The God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The same God who said, let there be light, can take your heart and let there be light. For this is encouraging news to know that the same God who created the same God that saves, and he does the same way by doing it completely for us, and that is what the Sabbath is a celebration of. Just think of what it's saying there in Deuteronomy chapter 5, when it's saying that, that remember the Sabbath for God, by his mighty hand, brought you out of Egypt. How did he do that? Moses goes to Egypt, and he, he tells them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you free. Pharaoh set set God's people free and, and the Israelites get upset because Pharaoh increases their workload and things get more difficult and they say Moses just stop doing this but God keeps sending him back to Pharaoh and, and Moses is reluctant he doesn't want to do it but God is on a mission to save his people even though they're not ready for it themselves and he sends plague after plague after plague and then what is the final plague it's the, the death of the firstborn but every person who wanted to join Israel was able to have their firstborn live. And how did that take place? All they had to do was to celebrate the Passover, to, to slaughter that, that Passover lamb, to take that blood and put it over the doorpost. If you had the blood, then your house would be spared. You think about it, right there, in the Ten Commandments, Moses is revealing to us that the gospel is revealed in the law of God. The, the cross is revealed. The fact that God loves us more than his own existence, that he has chosen from eternity past to adopt us in Christ, that we are his beloved children in Christ. All of that, him laying down his life on the cross, is revealed right there as he takes them out and he saves them by the blood of the Lamb. I love how it says it um, in the book, Christ Object Lessons, page 128. It says, the law is the gospel embodied. So the, the law itself is, is, is the gospel embodied. It's, it's not about a list of what God wants you to do, but it's a, a list about what God wants to do in your heart. The transformation that he wants to work in us. The law is the gospel embodied, and the gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root, the gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which, which it bears. Such a beautiful picture. The reality that the, the law and the gospel are not two separate things, that, that we, we have two separate dispensations. You have the Old Testament and there's a God there who's angry, who's wrathful, who's filled with justice. And then in the New Testament, suddenly Jesus comes and now we have a different way of salvation. No, the whole picture is Jesus, first and last and best in every person's life. That's the picture of what the Sabbath is all about, that Jesus has done it all. Another gift um, recently that, that I was thinking about for Christmas this past year, Uncle Tyson and Aunt Sheena Lynn gave my girls a little tiny trampoline for them to, to be able to jump on, to get some energy out. Great idea. Well. This trampoline came in a box, 
You know, Christmas for kids can be pretty disappointing because they're excited about the box and they're ripping open the wrapping paper and they're taking the, the, the part the I'm helping them open the box up and then we pull the trampoline out and they're like, jump on it, jump on it, jump on it, jump on it. No, you can't jump on it yet. It's, it's just a pile of parts and pieces and they're so excited they want... Hang on, we got to put this together. We've got to build it. And it takes a while and finally we build it and then finally they're able to jump on it. And then you know what happened? They kept saying, Thank you. We'd say, isn't it nice? Don't you like the trampoline? And they'd say, Daddy built it. We're like, yeah, yeah, but it's from Uncle Tyson and Aunt Sheenalyn. Daddy built it. No, it's from Uncle Tyson and Aunt Sheenalyn, but Daddy built it. As if it were a gift for me. Here's the thing. We tend to look at God's work in our life. We tend to look at salvation. We tend to see it as a gift that needs adding to, but it needs no additions. He has done it all. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He has accomplished it all. And that is the truth of the Sabbath. The Sabbath teaches us that six days we labor and we're trying to provide for ourselves, but God wants a repetitious reminder in our lives that every single week you can remember something. It's not about what you can contribute, what you can provide, but it's about what He has already done for you. And building that relationship with Him will change absolutely everything. I love how uh, the creation language is used to describe salvation in Ephesians chapter 2. And it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's the same power that he used to create out of nothing that he uses in our hearts to create a new reality of an ability to love. When you look at what takes place in Genesis, after this beautiful creation is given to Adam and Eve and they're given dominion over this planet, they made a really bad choice, which is pretty fascinating to read what could have taken place. I think the Sabbath is there specifically to help us recognize the beauty goodness of God, to recognize all that he is to us. In a publication, Signs of the Times, February 13, 1896, says this about the Sabbath. If man had always observed the Sabbath, there would never have been an unbeliever, an infidel, or an atheist in the world. Do you believe that? If we had, had just captured what the Sabbath is all about, there would never have been an atheist, an infidel, or an unbeliever in the entire world. And it goes on to say it this way. If Adam and Eve had contemplated the works of God in creating the world, if they had considered the reason that God had in giving them the Sabbath, if if they thought about why is it that God did this? Why did he create this? He wants the best for us. He wants a relationship with us. He's giving us time to be with him. He's making a temple in time so that we can have this relationship. He's a giver of so many good gifts. If they had considered the reason that God had given them, had in giving them the Sabbath, if they had looked upon the beautiful tokens he had given them in withholding nothing that would add to their happiness, they would have been safe. They would have adored him for his goodness and love toward them, and in place of listening to the sophistries of Satan and casting blame upon God and ascribing to him motives of selfishness, they would have considered the works of his hand and songs of melody and thanksgiving and praise would have burst forth from their lips in adoration of him who had bountifully supplied them with every good thing. If they had considered how he had made them the object of his overflowing love, they would not have fallen. But they forgot the presence of God. That they forgot that this is a God who loved them, who who was bestowing this gift upon them. He blessed it and sanctified it by filling it full of himself. So that they, you think about it, I remember when Leah and I um, first started dating and we were we were sitting there talking about our relationship. And as we talked about what was really important and what our relationship would look like. She said, you know, for me, it's not all about big gifts. And I'm thankful for that because I cannot afford $200,000 SUVs. So that wouldn't have worked out so well, let alone five of them. So it's not about big gifts, but what really matters to me 
is that we have quality time together. And this is what the God of the universe is saying. He's saying, hey, I just want to have a relationship with you. I want a friendship with you. I want for a special time where, where we can be together. And you can set aside the busyness, set aside the worries, set aside the cares, and fix your mind on me and on loving the people around you. What an incredible God to give us the gift of the Sabbath. And it's the same power that creates, that saves. And we see this most clearly revealed in that disciple who had that most close, loving relationship with the, the master. The one, the one who, at the Last Supper with Jesus, was reclining right next to him. John, the beloved disciple. John, when he goes to write his gospel, it, the story of Jesus, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he frames the whole story. Go with me to John chapter 1 based upon this idea of creation being how redemption takes place. In John chapter 1, he starts it off in the beginning. What does that sound like? He wants us to think back to Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He's saying, okay, in the beginning was the Word. He's reframing the whole story of redemption, helping us to see that Jesus is recreating humanity. So that salvation can take place. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then he goes on to highlight the creation took place through Jesus. Verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. He says, everything that was made in all of creation, everything that you've ever seen, came through Jesus. And it says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Just as God first spoke and said, let there be light, John said, the light came into the world, Jesus came into the world. And just as in Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image, John 1 and verse 14 says, and the word became flesh, he he took a body upon himself and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God steps into humanity's broken system, this broken world, and he begins the recreation process by coming close. And John is intentionally using creation language to describe the story of redemption, the story of salvation, the story of what Jesus has accomplished fully for you. You look at the story of Genesis after the fall because they weren't contemplating God's goodness as revealed in the Sabbath. After the fall, Adam and Eve, their family breaks down. Relational friction immediately begins to happen. Relational breakdown due to selfishness. You have Cain kills Abel. And then you see their descendants. It's a relational mess. You have Noah getting drunk and his his son mocking him. You have the craziness with Abraham lying, and you have Lot and the things that he did with his daughters. You have Sodom and Gomorrah. You have the flood. You have uh, you have Judah and the things that he does with Tamar. This incredible mess of relationships in Genesis, and it just goes on into failure after failure after failure throughout the Old Testament. But here, just like last week, we looked at how Jesus intentionally rewrites Israel's history. Jesus is the one who is the new creation. He has stepped into humanity, and he is now humanity 2.0, you might say. Adam, um, Paul says it this way in Romans. He says he is the, the second Adam. He's the, the, the new head of humanity. He is what humanity has been designed to be. And you can be recreated in his image by the same power that called into existence things which did not exist. You can be transformed from the inside out by that same word. And as Jesus goes about his life in the Gospel of John, you see that it's about relationships. First, he calls disciples into relationship with him, and they follow him. Then he's, he's going to the wedding feast, and at the wedding feast, he's, he's making things go more smoothly so that a family can have the joy of that marriage. One of the first stories is on marriage. Just like in Genesis, the first story 
is about Adam and Eve coming together in marriage. Then you go on to Genesis, uh, to, to John chapter 3, and in John chapter 3, you have Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, and there's this relationship being built between Nicodemus and Jesus that in the end, Nicodemus is the one who comes to support the disciples. Then in John chapter 4, you have him seeking after the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman, and, and offering her this gift of life. And you have in John chapter 5, the pool of Bethesda, and this relationship is built time and time again. He's restoring and rebuilding relationships. And in John chapter 13, it says that he knew that all things were his, and so he loved his own to the very end by serving them. And he gets down and he washes their feet in the upper room to show that this is what God is all about. And then in John chapter 17, John chapter 17, when he's praying that final prayer, that high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he says this. Now, I want you to think about the language that was used in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, when it said God completed, God finished the heavens and the earth, and because he had finished it, he rested. This wasn't a, a need for physical rest, but it was the fact that he wanted to not be busy for Adam and Eve on that day, that they could spend time together. And in John chapter 17, verse 4, as Jesus is describing how the hour has come for him to go to the cross, he prays this in verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. I've completed the work. I have recreated. I have finished redemption. It is an accomplished fact. And then on the cross in John chapter 19, as Jesus is brutally whipped, beaten, put on the cross, he's mistreated, abused. There on the cross, as he's forgiving his enemies, he finally says in that last breath, it is finished. Friends, I want you to let that sink in this morning. It's finished. That means the entire victory of the great controversy is finished. The victory that you need in your life is already accomplished. And when we come to the Sabbath, it's with a realization that Jesus has already done it all. And we can bask in the incredible goodness of a God who loved us more than his own existence. And think about it this way. When he was there dying on the cross, when did he say it is finished? What time of day was it? It was in the towards the end of the day, right? On Friday? And that was the time when the Passover lamb would have been sacrificed. It's on Friday, the sixth day of the week, that Jesus says, it is finished. This, this recreation of who humanity is supposed to be. It was on the sixth day, after all the animals had been created, after Eve had been brought from, from Adam's side, and they were both there together, that finally creation was completed. Do you see the mirror, the, the clear uh, parallels that there is between what is being described about what Jesus has done and creation. And it gets even clearer because what happens is that Jesus says, it is finished there on the cross. He dies. And what does he do next? He rests in the tomb during the Sabbath hours. Luke, Luke makes that so clear that the disciples rush to get him into the tomb. And then he is resting in the tomb during the Sabbath. God has completed his work. And so he rests. It is finished, and so he rests. And so you and I, when we come to the Sabbath, we are not adding anything to salvation by keeping the Sabbath. Instead, the Sabbath is what keeps us. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is what reminds us of our Creator, our Redeemer, who has done absolutely everything for us. That's, he's so crazy about us. That he wasn't okay with having a holiday once a month, having a, a holiday once a year. But he said, I want time for those people, for humanity, once a week. I want to build that friendship with them in an extra special way where they can have an entire day to simply focus on that relationship with me. And you, and you don't have to worry during that day about providing for yourself. You don't have to worry about all of the cares of life. But you can rest in dependence upon me. 
Friend, I believe that that's what this world that is full of unrest desperately needs to know, that there is a God who has accomplished that, it all for them, that they can come and they can rest in his saving grace. In the book, Faith and Works, it says, it is the favor of God that pardons. It is the favor of God that leads us by his power to repentance. Therefore, it is all of Jesus Christ, everything of him. And you want to just give back glory to God. Why don't you respond more when you meet together in your meetings for worship? Why, why isn't there more excitement in worship? She goes on to describe, why don't you have the quickening influences of the spirit of God when the love of Jesus and his salvation are presented to you? It is because you do not see that Christ is first and last and best and the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the very author and finisher of your faith. You don't realize this and therefore you remain in your sins. And friends, I'm just here this morning to repent, to say, you know what? I don't get excited enough about the gospel. I don't get excited enough about church. I don't get excited enough about the Sabbath. For too long, it's been about going through the motions. But friends, the love of Christ compels us. It leads us to worship. It leads us to ascribe worth to this beautiful God who's given us every possible gift and then says, hey, I want you to have a day off every week to be with me. And in that time, to serve and to love and to give to those around you. What an incredible gift. But just imagine that Leah and I schedule a date together. We say, okay, next Sunday, we're going to take the day and we're going to go on a date day. We're going to go down over to Cambria and we're going to go, uh, we're going to pack a picnic lunch and we're going to go to the beach and we're going to have this beautiful day enjoying it. And so I show up on Monday to pick Leah up. So we're like, well, where were you yesterday? Well, it doesn't really matter, right? We're, we're, at least we're going to spend the time together. That's what's important, right? Just so long as we spend the time together. Let me ask. My birthday is, is in February. But if you wish me a happy birthday today, I'll say, well, what's wrong with you? What are you thinking about? If I show up on the wrong day for my wife's date, it's not very meaningful. And then if, if we're, we're in the middle of that date and we're enjoying each other, we're sitting on the beach, uh, we're, we're eating our, our sandwiches that we've made, and, and I keep looking at my watch. Okay, I got another 30 minutes. Pull out my phone. I got some messages I got to get out. Okay. Check some emails. Let's see. Okay. Um, when are we leaving again? Is this day almost over? When is this date going to end? It reveals something about my heart. It reveals that I'm missing something. I've lost that connection. Lee and I have talked about having kids keeps us so incredibly busy that we've got to be more and more intentional about blocking out time for the two of us just to be together. And God wants us to be intentional about blocking out time to be with him, especially on the seventh day Sabbath, because it is a day for us to bask in the love that loved us more than his own existence, that said, it is finished. We celebrate the Sabbath, we worship on the Sabbath, we keep the Sabbath when we recognize that he is the author and finisher, he is absolutely everything to us. I wanna appreciate the Sabbath more, and I wanna live in the light of what the Sabbath is all about, not just to celebrate it one day a week, but to celebrate it every day, to recognize every day the incredible value of the Sabbath. One last thing from Steps to Christ, page 69, it says, many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin, but now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. But every such effort must fail. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness all depend upon our union with Christ. It is by communion with him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. He is to be with us not only at the beginning and the end of our course, but at every step of the way. Friends, you have a God who wants to be with you. 
He wants especially to be with you on the Sabbath, but not just on the Sabbath. He wants you to live in the spirit of what the Sabbath represents throughout the week, to live lives of worship. That's why Ezekiel could write in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, that the Sabbath is a sign that it's God who sanctifies us. It's God who transforms us. It's God who recreates us, who makes us new creation, who can say to the darkness of our hearts, let there be light. As we close, we just want to listen to this song, Temple of Time, as it describes the beauty of the Sabbath. I want you just to ask God, what is it that you want for me and my relationship with you? How can I experience this reality of redemption? How can I accept it more fully in my heart today and every day? And how can I make the Sabbath a more special opportunity to be with you and every day have that relationship where I am communing and abiding in you? How many of you want to take greater delight in the Sabbath? To really soak in his goodness, to come to recognize what an amazing God of love that he is, that he gives and he gives and he gives. He's done it all. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you that in the midst of the busyness, in the midst of the unrest that is surrounding us, you invite us to rest in your accomplished work of creation and redemption. Thank you that we can celebrate who you are and what you've done. God, forgive me for thinking that it's about what I can accomplish, for becoming a human doing rather than recognizing that I am your beloved child with whom you are well pleased in Christ. Lord God, may this reality of your love for us bear fruit in our lives. May we be your new creations, that Christ living in us would love the world around us, God, the world is so full of darkness right now. It desperately needs to see your love revealed. Would you please transform us as we fix our eyes on the amazing God of love that you are? Would you lead us to delight more fully in the Sabbath to appreciate this incredible weekly gift you've given us to take time off with you? We love you, God. Thank you for this incredible gift. Bless my friends as they go out to delight themselves in you this Sabbath. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.